Here we are at Big Wheel Press in East Hampton with the proprietor and founder. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing and, and your name? Uh, my name is Bill Muller. Uh, we're a letterpress studio using traditional relief printing styles. Um, we cast our own type on line casters and we print on presses uh, aging from 1886 up through 1963. How long have you been doing this? Big Wheel's been around seven years now. Um, but in the process of uh, going through my memories, I realized back in 1963, my parents gave me a little letterpress for the holidays. That planted the seed. It planted the seed. It had movable type, and I printed the family newsletter. And mm -hmm. um, then in high school, our high school was um, done on letterpress in the newspaper, so I worked on that. Where was that? In Los Angeles. Okay. And then um, I worked for the Valley Advocate for a number of years. When printing was in the paste-up phase, there was no relief printing at that point, so offset. And then uh, seven years ago, a friend and I decided to buy a couple presses, and it's grown from there. How long have you had the Art Guild? Because you also have a Guild Art, Supply art store in town. Yeah, Guild Art Supply has been around for 31 years. And you started that? I started that in 1984. Wow. And uh, that's... Uh, now, you originally started your press in the basement. Yeah, we had a basement space that was about 300 square feet. Um, we now have 2,200 square feet, and we'll probably fill it in the next couple of years. What was your first uh, press? What did first press uh, was a 1886 Golden Pearl Model 14. Was that that huge thing that uh, took up the whole 300 square feet? No, no, it's, it's, it's one of our smallest. Their, their sales pitch back in the 1880s, 1890s was that it took up less floor space than other presses. Um, and we still do quite a few wedding invitations and uh, commercial pieces on it. And along with that press, we got a, um, a Chandler and Price Pilot Press, which is uh, another platen press, clamshell. Um, the Golding is a treadle press, which I can show you in a little bit, and the, the uh, Pilot is a hand-operated. Now, it seems like you started off small and you keep getting more involved. I mean, have you reached the level that you want to be at now, or is there another no, our next, level? Our next level is uh, more of a mechanized letterpress. We're getting in a Heidelberg uh, red ball, um, and we have a Mealy Vertical, which are presses that can run you know, 20,000 copies a day um, and are very, very accurate. Um, right now, everything is literally pumped by hand or foot. So, Now, the presses that you're getting are uh, older presses. What were they originally used for? Printing books, newspapers? Books, uh, newspapers. Um, many presses evolved in, to uh, die-cutting machines. Um, as the letterpress itself waned in print shops. So a lot of these presses we get, and they're kind of in sad shape, and we bring them back to life, we restore them. Were there still uh, letterpresses around here when you started uh, Art Guild? Um, well, I used to come over here and visit Harold McGrath, who was okay. in, in the yeah. basement here. He had a, a very nice Heidelberg, and I believe one or two Vandercook proof presses. Was he doing his own work at that time? He was doing work primarily for Barry Moser. Okay. I mean, and uh, he shared a studio when I met him with Alan Robinson. Okay. Uh, how long ago did uh, Harold that, pass? Oh, oh a long time. Question. That's like 20 years ago, I think. Yeah. I mean, he was so important to the printing. And, of yeah, and he was, he was meticulous. He didn't look it. He looked like just kind of like the guy you see at the local bar with his baseball cap on. Mm -hmm. and, um, I know somebody like I can't remember his name right now, but I grew. I, I spent a lot of time in Santa Barbara, California, for Black Sparrow Press. Yeah, was now in Santa Rosa, and it might have moved around. But there was a guy like that too, kind of. Like yeah, I think they moved. To, they moved north, I think. Yeah, my um, daughter's in Santa Barbara now. Yeah. He was a, just a real hardworking guy with a, a, a real artistic sense. I mean, Black Sparrow. Everybody collects them now. Yeah. Uh, not just for the authors. What was his name? I can't remember his name. I should have come more prepared. This is the part I'll edit in, or it makes it sound like a lot of I would say that they got taken over by a university at some point. Okay. Or they're the ones who are connected with m &H type founders in San Francisco. Now. Okay. Did, but, now, did you grow up in LA? Um, from age 8 till 18. Mm -hmm. Where did you come from before you were there? Uh, Morristown, New Jersey. What took you to Los Angeles? No, my father, we were literally the Beverly Hillbillies. We, my father worked for a little company in Orange, New Jersey, mm -hmm. and it was bought by 
a big corporation and he was transferred to Beverly Hills. <laughs> so it went from Orange, New Jersey to Beverly Hills. Uh, our house, my mother's house is still in, uh, in Los Angeles. LA at that time must have been quite an exciting Oh, it was place like, to, you know, it was, you know, the Sunset Strip was all the hippies and yeah. Charles Manson was happening and um, Patty Hearst. Oh, the music. Yeah. The, oh, the music was amazing. Yeah, the painting, the yeah. filmmaking, the art. Oh, yeah, Venice Beach was just a yeah. very reasonable place to live. Yeah. Now it's like the most expensive. Now, what brought you to the valley? I went to, I lived in Berkeley for a while. And uh, then decided I wanted to find a place to start doing some things. And my sister was here. So we, I moved and never went away. One of the things about the valley, and one of the things that probably attracted me too, well, I'm also a Californian, is its love of the past. It's a reverence for the past. Whereas in California, they can't wait to tear something down. Oh, no. Down. I mean, it's it something new. Here, the past is alive. Yeah. It never went away. So. Yeah, most of our presses come from people who really want to see press preserved. The, the classic thing is an old printer retires and he brings home enough bits of equipment to keep printing and he passes away. We get a phone call and we find, you know, these 2,000 pound presses down in the basement that we have to, you know, jury rig out and transport here. But uh, virtually every press here has a face behind it that, you know, we, you know, we met or are you documenting any of this as you go along, keeping a I keep, I keep a journal of where journal. We, yeah. we got things so that people yeah. know in the future. That would be interesting. We just see. got 24 fonts of linotype matrices, which are the molds for casting uh, type on the linotype machine, from a, a woman whose father had passed and had a little print shop in his garage. And now, when you say casting type, I understand casting linotype that's machine-driven with molten lead and do you actually create typefaces? Do you no in in metal? We we seek out the old molds. Mm -hmm. Oh, but you're still doing it in the molds, yeah. Oh yeah, I can I can show you that whatever. You're what writing. what kind of metal do you pour into? It's a it's a lead based. You know, it's, it's lead. eighty percent lead. You know, is that dangerous at all? No, we only heat to five hundred and fifty degrees. If we reach over six hundred, it would start vaporizing. Okay, and we get tested every year for lead, mm -hmm. and show probably less than an average person would. I mean, it's just we don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to end up like a mad hatter. Yeah. Well, let's take a little walk around and, and have a look at this incredible space. Why don't you tell us just a little bit about some of the things that are here behind you? We're well, the broadsides on the wall are ones that we sell online. Um, most of them we just make for ourselves. Some of them we make for events. Um, uh, you know, this is one I made last night um, uh, for the I Am Charlie um, phenomenon in France right now. It's very sad, but um, I cast the uh, middle set of type in Yiddish, which is probably the only Yiddish that's been cast in that size in decades. This machine we are using to cast um, Yiddish and Hebrew and the only difference is that the molds were created upside down so that things can, would read right to left <laughs> instead of left to right. It's not like there's a different machine right. to do Yiddish. Um, so right now we're working on that. I'm working with a, a fellow at the Yiddish Book Center, and she and I are translating some, some poems and casting them in lead, and we're making a series of broadsides based on uh, women poets from the earliest 20th century. So this machine is, is one that's up and running. This one is our next project. Um, needs a few more parts that we're sourcing out in the world. Then we're, we're going to move. Now, do you get any benefit out of this new uh, 3D printing that's going on? It's, not, you, it's not creating a surface that's hard enough yet for us to use. Uh, we do use modern technology to make our plates. Because I've heard you can do 3D printing with metal, but maybe just not in the I think strength that you I don't need. think it's strong enough yet. Yeah. Um, so the next okay, press down. Let's run down there. Okay. Okay. This is a, a Mealy B50 vertical press. Um, it's an automated press. It actually the paper feeds through vacuums into the press. The impression is made, and then they are sucked out the back. This press we could do 25,000 impressions a day, but one of its greatest benefits is that it gives a very strong, clear impression. Um, 
and it's you know it's a fountain inking system, so we don't have to constantly re re ink it. Um, this is one of our inking tables where we mix colors for some of our smaller presses. And what's interesting here is that you know, I've been talking about casting lead type, and we use wooden type, and we carve linoleum blocks. But I can also design on my computer screen um, a plate that we then make from a negative and it makes, it makes a raised either polymer or magnesium plate that we can use. If we know we're going to be running an image for months on end for a project, we usually get magnesium made because they last longer and they lay flatter. Most wedding invitations we do, or we do with polymer plates these days. Now, a lot of your broadsides are done with wood type. Yeah, we have a, a large collection of wood type, probably 100, 100 typefaces, 100 fonts. And uh, so we will combine you know, wood type with a polymer plate or you know, a carved linoleum block to create one of our broadsides. Now, your broadsides I've always found very whimsical and, yeah. and fun. Uh, are you the person that comes up with these uh, it's, it's, crazy it's, ideas? There's two of us. There's Chris uh, Campbell I work with, and I do them. I, his are the science-based ones. You know, Mine are more uh, large image-based. You said they're for sale on Etsy. Uh, Etsy, Scout Mob, you know, our site, you know, basically online. We, we take them to shows also. We have open studios here twice a year that we sell them at. So people could come to uh, Guild Art and, yeah. and find them there. Yep. And, and on your uh, Guild Art, I'm sure, has a website in there. Yeah, that's uh, guildartsupply.com. Great. This is an 1886 Golding Pearl, number 14. It's a treadle press, uh, it's a clamshell. Um, we feed the paper in up here, the type sits up here, and the rollers and the ink discs uh, distribute the ink on everything. And it's all run by a treadle. So we throw the wheel off, and we would sit here and feed a piece of paper in. It would be impressed, take it out, feed another piece in, and you could do this all day long. Um, back in the day, they literally would keep track of you, make sure you're doing enough impressions an hour. Um, but even though this is you know, well over 100 years old, we use it every week to print wedding invitations. And um, I just printed a piece for Oxford University on this that we mailed off to London. So this is an 1896 Golding Pearl um, Platin letterpress. And I'm printing a part of a bar mitzvah invitation um, using modern technology, I'm using a raised polymer plate that I, uh, an image I created on the computer screen and then made a plate from it. And it, this press is great because it's, even though it's our oldest press from 1896, it works great and it works by treadling. And right now I'm inking up the plate and inserting the paper engaging it, and just made that image. Is this one of your favorite presses? Is this one? Oh yeah, this one I can do just about anything you know, invitation-wise on, or business card, um, because it's travel operated. It's you have a little more control over it. A little more control. I do power it up when I'm inking. It helps uh, save me a little time. I, do the, I run it off the motor. That's what that pulley over here is for. Now you've set the type on a plate over there, that's what we yeah, see. This is, I, I use the polymer plate, which is similar to the technology used for making a silk screen, except instead of making a hole in the screen, it hardens up the material to give it a raised height. Um, so I get a really nice impression. Um, What's the lifetime of a... Uh... Oh, I can do 10,000 impressions on that if I want. Yeah. It's only short-term problems are that for large area, it wants to curl over time, so it's a matter of getting the job done now and recycling the plate. It looks um, really, really cool. Um, did you design the uh, invitation yourself? Yeah, this is... Um, I want to hold it up and, and I'll focus in yeah, on this it. This is just one part. This is going to get a second color border around it. Then this is going to be one panel on a big fold-out. So there's a total of five panels in, in total of six colors. Is this the craziest invitation you've ever printed? Pretty much so. I mean, this is going to have a spinning wheel on one page, 
Um, it's a carnival theme, and um, it took a long time to get the details of the design. So in. this shows uh, the custom work that you can do. I mean, you can't walk into uh, to okay. Staples and say, hey, uh, print me an invitation that has no, a can't. spinning is, wheel on it. Um, this kid will have the only invitation like this in the whole world. Is it giving it kind of a three-dimensional feel by doing yeah, this? it's almost braille. In the olden days, you'd want to have as little impression as possible. You just want to kiss the page. Uh -huh. But these days, brides or Mr. Kids, they want to they want to feel the old time the impression of. Well, you can't get that with a Xerox printer, you can't. for sure. Because that's just laying uh, ink or graphite down onto a page. Now, where did this press come from? How old is it? This was 1996. It was made in Boston. Um, we got it out of a basement in Great Barrington. And, uh, was it intact? Or it looks like there's been, been a few repairs? It was stored by the previous owner. Which, uh, it was ready to print. We just replaced the, um, the rollers. That's what seems amazing about these presses. I mean, they're made of steel and iron. They aren't going anywhere. I mean, it's well, so you can see how this one has had a few little yeah. bumps and it's a little... Yeah, you can see like where the shiny metal is, is, yeah. is the new stuff, but it looks very minor, you know, a few screws. And... Well, the, the guy who restored this actually found it in pieces in a gully in North Adams. And he in a gully? Yeah, went back, raised the cast <laughs> iron back together. And, um... That's amazing. Now what I'm doing with these prints is I'm double inking each one. Taking it out of engagement between impressions, so the rollers will put an extra coating of ink on it. What kind of ink do you use? Any cover base inks mostly. Um, they allow me to leave. They don't. They don't dry until they're absorbed by paper. So I can leave them on a metal surface overnight and continue printing the same next day. Did you ever see the book that uh, Bill Streeter did about uh, before photocopying the book presses? I just interviewed him a couple weeks ago. Yeah, and, it's and he was ex explaining the process. It was it was pretty amazing. It was they just had this ink with uh, gum arabic in it. Yeah. So it would stick. And uh, yeah, early inks took forever to dry. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I find movies about that include letterpress. And I just saw a new one, I think from 2013, called The Wiping Times. Okay. It's, it's a true story from World War I, where these American soldiers find a printing press and decide to put out a satirical newspaper to cheer up their comrades. And it's called The Wiping Press, because after they're done reading it, because there was a shortage of toilet paper, they can tear it apart and, <laughs> and make use of it. Oh, very American there. Now, besides uh, getting these presses from these old pressmen, do you also get information from them? Because learning how to run these must be as complex as they look, uh, and it's, maintaining them. It's and funny, the, the, the biggest source of information is, well, other than trial and error, these days is YouTube. <laughs> the little old printer guys with nothing else to do out there make a million videos of how to kind do like a certain model type. railroad you can go on and find right. anything about model railroad. we were watching um you know a restoration page the other day it was like wow why didn't we try that before um there are a, a bunch of old timers out there that are really helpful we're members of a couple uh, internet mail groups that we exchange ideas back and forth and you know every day that i come in here you learn something new there's always another thing another step um, that makes your next print job better. Are there other printers in the area that you share ideas with, uh, get on the phone, you know, talk to, uh, visit? You know, uh, 20 years ago, there were a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, I can probably think of three in the area that... Who were those? Uh, Art Larson in, in um, Hadley, and uh, Dan Keller, who's from Wild Carrot Press. Mm -hmm. They're great. They're like master printers that know more about all these things than anybody. Um, they do they have the same kind of equipment as you? Um, some of the same or similar. Um, uh, Dan has the same Lancaster I do. 
Um, Art has a Vanderkirk like ours. We'll be getting in, the, the Heidelberg we're getting in, both of them have, so that'll be really helpful to have them around. And then there's just a couple other, you know, art printers out there that, you know, are doing, you know, some small chapbooks and... Well, you're an art printer as well as a journeyman. Um, you are doing art, but you're also doing, like you said, wedding invitations. We do, and, uh, yeah, we do commercial work. Um, I've also, we've also printed um, portfolios for artists. Um, we did an 18 uh, piece portfolio for the UMass Art Museum a couple of years ago. Um, we've done projects with Historic Northampton, um, Amherst College, the Mead Art Museum there. Have you printed any books? We've done mostly chapbooks, so some, you know, poetry books. Um, we do a lot of covers for people. A uh, classic thing right now is when scholars publish a book, the um, academic publishers are not putting slipcovers on them anymore. So we will do custom slipcovers to take that you know, $80 textbook and make it into you know, a piece of art. Interesting, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, they're really getting cheap. I mean, I recently purchased a book by a professor I know, $120, no slipcover. The other thing that they're doing is all of the uh, scholarly matter that used to be included in the book, they're dumping onto a website. So. Now you're getting a book and all of the uh, yeah. you know, bibliographies and uh, right. footnotes and everything else are dumped on some website someplace. Or, or no one's expecting the hardcover to sell. Yeah. They get those you know, instant books and um, you know, I refuse to buy those. The market, the market for books is very small. Want, we want a good type collection. Um, they range from the 1880s through probably 1920. Um, We've actually, there are actually a couple of companies that are making new wood type, which is kind of amazing. Some folks in upstate New York are making wood type, and we're getting some wood type from India, but it's hand carved. Why in India? Because they're still doing it, or? Well, what's happened is when I started buying these, you know, eight years ago, you could buy a full font for $100. Sometimes some, some of these fonts are going for $1,200 now. So the, all of a sudden it's worthwhile to start making new wood type again. Um, now this, not to beat a dead horse because I'm not an expert on it, this seems like an ideal place to do 3D printing is for... Yeah, right now it's, it's not... It's just not there yet. It's not creating a surface that's hard enough. We're putting hundreds of pounds per square inch on this type. Okay. And one yeah, reason, it's mainly plastic that they're doing it. And yeah. Stuff. yeah, and one reason we like casting our own type because every time we cast it we're getting fresh, brand new type that's all the right size. As Wood type gets older and used more and more, that it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. So there's a lot more make ready or preparing the, the image when you're working with this old type than if you're working with brand new type. Um, and it's even more so with handset metal type, which the metal just gets pounded and pounded and pounded and pounded. Let's go take a look at that. It's actually this, most of the metal is over here. So this is called a California job case. All the lowercase letters are over here. And uh, let me let my guy in here. <laughs> How did I get the name of California job case? What is that? What's, what's up with it's that? like there's myth and lore about that. There's actually people have written books about all the different layouts of these cases. Um, but supposedly a company in California or, or newspapers in California just, theirs became the standard. Um, the funny thing is, is that a lot of cases are laid out with a certain German uh, influence because there's a lot of um, a lot of fonts with ligatures, which are letters that are cast next to each other that you would use on a regular base basis. Like a, a normal one would be a Q U that are closer together or a T H, but a lot of fonts come with F F F or F F L for mm -hmm. German words. Mm -hmm. We never use them. The most interesting thing is 90% of the fonts that we buy are kind of shy on punctuation. But the one thing that they are missing that is now being recast on a regular basis is the, the pound symbol. Because people are using hashtags for their tweets. And in order to set it in letterpress, 
someone's got to start casting these again. So this You're really this trapped is, between between two worlds here. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, when we first started out, we couldn't get we couldn't find any ads for doing um, you know mm -hmm. email addresses, and finally those started becoming available. So a little box like this, you know, allows us to set. Amazing. Could you hold it up just a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. So hashtags and... How about wingdings? Wingdings, we have, or we call them ornaments. Um, we collect a lot of them. Um, everything from old, uh, old gasoline logos to uh, little pointing hands. Um, one of our favorite stories is going to be over there. <laughs> one of our favorite stories is what's in these, this drawer and two other drawers. I, there was a, went out to an, a farmer's place in Waitley and I saw that he had for sale uh, a type cabinet, but it was empty. And I said, do you have any other letterpress stuff? And he said, yeah, I've got all the letters. And he pointed to the wheelbarrow way back in some field, a piece of card, uh, plywood over, tarp over that. I went out there, and there was 150 pounds of letterpress ornament. Not, not letters, but actual ornament. And you salvaged them? We salvaged them. Are these them? These are them. And an ornament is you know, a decorative item that you can add to mm -hmm. um, a printed piece. That's quite a find. Yeah. A little and, uh, it took us months to sort it out, but we actually found some really cool things. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, this is composed completely out of ornament from that wheelbarrow. So these are all individual pieces. Um, we found an entire alphabet of these letters. So we fashioned it into a heart and we you know, print greeting cards from that. So you really have a lot of fun doing creative things with your typefaces, not just... It's a very immediate printing. process. We can come in here, pull out a drawer, and create something. We don't have to you know, wait around for... Well, we have to wait around for the lead to melt. But. You're, you're concrete poets. Um, these are um, type drawers called California job cases. Um, we use them for all kinds of things. We have, but you pull one out, you pull the one out below it a little bit to support it because these drawers weigh a lot and they could easily just end up on the ground. And when my interns start out here, they're given one of these little cards, you give them a little cheat sheet for where everything's located. Um, and you set upside down and backwards so you can actually read what you're doing, but it's upside down. Let me get in close up and, and see exactly what so I'm composing upside down and backwards so I can read what I'm doing, but when it gets dropped into the chase to be composed into a larger piece, it'll print the right direction. But it's easier to keep track of what I'm doing. Now it's always fascinated me that printers can set type upside down and backwards really fast. Yeah, I'm not that fast. But. How, how, how does <laughs> how does your mind wrap itself around doing? You know, this? it's funny. You just you just uh, get used to it. And my my wife always goes, "Why don't you just write the names of everything on here?" But you know, you get used to it. And um, each font is a little bit different, uh, depending. I, I can't imagine back in the old days, like doing a whole newspaper. You know, oh, this every day going out, setting type upside down and backwards. Well, that was the whole the whole deal with our linotype machine is yeah. that. Um, until newspapers, until that machine was invented, newspapers were no bigger than eight or 12 pages because they had to have guys <laughs> doing it by hand. But that is really interesting. I never thought about that. But there's a great movie called Park Row where it's about the invention of the, the line of type. And, the, and in the beginning, they show a guy setting type almost as fast as that machine can go. It's, it's really amazing. Cool. Yeah. Okay. We, I find this all over the place, um, and as time goes on, it gets more and more rare. And we have it fairly small, and then... Are these all wooden that we're looking at? These right are all here? wooden. They're probably from the 1880s. Um, 
This font was actually saved from a fire. There's a few pieces that are a little scorched, <laughs> like this one. And you can see how the heat completely shrunk the exclamation point. That's cool. Okay, I'm gonna get in on that. Okay. Um, are there any craftspeople still making these? Is yeah, there like is, a there's a rebirth. There's a company making? called Virgin Wood Type in upstate New York who's who's making new type. Um, What's the you, process of doing that? You use a pantograph. What is that? Pantograph is um, a reducing enlarging device that uses crossed arms and your pattern for the letter would be over here and you take your stylus on one end of this device and move it around the outline of the letter. Over on this side, there's another stylus that has reduced it down to a size and it's using like a, a, a router or a Dremel tool or whatever mm -hmm. to cut out a letter. But saying that, I, we were able to get this font, which is a nice circus themed font from India and these are all hand carved. And we, were, we didn't know that until we got it, but you can see the, the, the blade marks on it. Is that something that in India they're, they're still doing? No, what anything? it's turned out to be is that wood type has become such a collector's item for non-printers that a price of a font has gone up between 400 to $1,200. So all of a sudden it's economically feasible to start making wood type again. Interesting. I remember reading somewhere that uh, the last real typewriter factory in the world is in India because they still, oh, really? they still enjoy That's crazy. typewriters, yes. It's hard to get them fixed. Yeah. We have a Hebrew typewriter that is just mind-boggling because it goes backwards. <laughs> I've seen a Chinese typewriter because they have like 2,000 I can't imagine characters. that. It's like this gigantic well, Chinese, piano kind of looking. Chinese thing. letterpress shops are, you know, for one font it's about the size of this room. I mean, it's just amazing how much room it takes to fit a font. Yeah, interesting, yeah. Had your little bookstore back in 1860, and you needed business cards, or you needed price tags, you'd have a printing press this size. Just a little tiny thing like and that. And the way yeah. it would work was, where is it? You'd put a little ink up here, and you'd roll it out flat, and then you'd take your image, or your type, you'd slide it in there. I'll actually back that up. You ink it there, then you'd ink your type, slide it in, slide in a piece of paper, and make your little price tag or your business card. Now, if you were a little bit more uh, prosperous of a business, up to this size and maybe you could do some greeting cards or but this one your type would go there ink would go on the rollers and on the ink plate and your piece of paper would go there and it's just the same way that our other tabletop ones so you really have to be a printer to use as you just like if you had this a was like grocery the, store this was the inkjet printer store. of the 1870s <laughs> and depending on how busy your business was you'd have bigger and bigger and bigger and you know the hotel, Wiggins Tavern, had a iron hand press for years that they printed menus on, up until like the 70s. What did they do with that press, do you know? It disappeared somewhere. You know, just, when yeah. that hotel closed, it was amazing. Um, it was decorated with original Courier and Ives prints. Yeah. Not, oh. the, not the crummy, you know, reprints. Wow. Full of them. I mean, whoever bought it, you know, got a good deal on it. They could have sold those for, you know, wow. thousands of them. Yeah. So who knows what else was in there? It could be some of these things could be down in their basement somewhere. They still have actually they turned they finally turned those the printing room into some rooms recently. You know the, I think I remember the printing room. There were so many things done there. Yeah, if you go on eBay just yeah. Google Wiggins Tavern, you see pictures of it. But sure. And also inside they have framed framed menus from that time. Cool. Big mess here, but this is a nineteen forties platen press. Um, there would have been, he would have been used in a vocational school. He would have gone in there with 20 tables just like this one with drawers of type. And, and this one, the type goes up in here just like the, the pearl. But this one's all hand operated. No treadle. It's no just treadle. That, that so when you actually thing. make the impression, you, when you push down, you can actually kind of feel how much impression is being made and you can adjust it. 
Now special. you mentioned earlier that uh, a, a real hand feel when you're running these presses is important. What does that mean in terms of well, with not that, getting too big of an impression? Too yeah, with that press, is, um, normally an older press like this would have what's called a fountain on it, constantly feeding ink onto the ink plate. Um, but through time that was lost, so I have to look at each print, decide if there's more ink needs to go on it, stop the press, re-ink for a little while. So it's, you know, it's, it really is a hand press. Every, pr every print that comes out, I, I look at and determine if it's okay. Amazing. Yeah, you don't think about it. You think, oh, well, the machine is doing it all, but no. there is the human touch There's definitely involved human all the way along. <laughs> Could we see you um, pulling some type and maybe, you know, doing what you do, setting it? Ludlow Linecaster. And it would have been used for making headlines or single lines of type. Um, a lot of small shops had this because they could set a line of type for a business card really quickly. And it uses lead to melt down to temperature, up to a temperature of 550 degrees. So back here in this cauldron is hot lead ready for casting. Now, was that sitting there all ready to go or did you turn it on? I, can't, I turned this on about an hour and a half ago. Okay. Where yeah. do you buy your lead? Um, well, the great thing about it, you think of lead as being like this toxic waste. But when we get done with something, um, we just put it back in and recycle it. Just drop it in there like that? Yeah. Huh. So we but have not gone through our supply of lead yet. That is fantastic. Yeah, you just recycle it. There are some things that we decided we want to keep for a little while, um, but then eventually they get melted down. So. Every one of these drawers throughout the building contains one font and one size, and these are the molds. And I slide the molds into the Ludlow, turn it on, and when I press up on this button, a plunger shoots down and shoots hot lead up into those molds. It's already cool to the what's, touch? What's, it's, pretty, it's like a baked potato right now. <laughs> My hands are used Because you said 500 degrees is enough. Okay. Yeah, it cools down pretty quickly. I mean, once it, um, my hands are a little bit used to it, but it's still. Yeah, that's not, I would have thought it would be like just scalding. Oh, no. You know, there is a, like a, a crude radiator in here that helps cool things down, but not really. But, you know, I'll print with this, and then when I'm done, Hmm. It was back in the bit. Now, I live up near a town called Leadville yeah. because this area was known for lead, <clears throat> which was particularly used for uh, weaponry or for ammunition yeah. back in the day. This was kind of an arsenal for the uh, revolutionary forces. Does any lead still come from around here or is that just too esoteric? It's too esoteric and plus it's not a pure, it's not pure lead, there's antimony and um, tin in it so there's a certain mix mm -hmm. to make it hard enough but still soft enough to be released. So is this pure lead that you use? It, would you call it's about 80%. It? Is there something else in it? Nickel or something to harden mm -hmm. it up? What is, what's the other Oh, the antimony. Oh, it is antimony, yeah. okay. Yeah, and the tin. It's interesting, um, we you know, a lot of these, we get a lot of blocks. Okay. So this is a copper engraving that we found at a book and ephemera auction in Northampton. And when we got it, it was pretty much covered in old ink. We really couldn't see very well what it was, but we cleaned it up, restored it, and we were able to print from it. And it actually is a map of Northampton um, from 1831. This Engraving was probably made around 1931, giving the, the style of plate. Um, it might have been an anniversary of this um, printing, of the original printing. Um, you know, I don't know how many more years we're going to get out of this plate, but enough. Um, the next oldest press over there is the Iron Hand Press. Press. Um, this is the same style mechanism that would have been used hundreds of years ago. So this one's from 1899, it would have been used for proofing uh, copper engravings at a newspaper. Um, but we use it for art prints now. Um, and the story of this company is great. Um, they were in Chicago during the 
Chicago Fire. And when they saw the fire coming to their side of town, they loaded their entire contents of their factory into horse-drawn carts and drove them into the lake. And Brilliant waited. thinking. And waited until the fire passed. That, and that is and this company evolved race into under pressure. It evolved into another company that is still around making some printing equipment. So, can you move that lever? Can you show us yeah. That, what that happens is works? this gets cranked in to the the back. Right now, it's not connected, but your type would go here. Paper would be dropped down on it after you inked it, and then when you pull this lever, the plant goes down and squeezes on the paper, creating the impression. I see where you've created a new, a couple new pieces of a yeah, this the machine. This, these are actually original. This was uh, lost at some point in history. And the guy we got it from uh, had that fabricated. But um, yeah, this, is, this press came to us restored, which was really nice. Where do you get your paper and uh, what kind of paper do you use? Well, that's really the thing that ties everything I do together. I've been a paper merchant for over 30 years. That's right. So I've, I've got a lot of connections with uh, paper makers around the world, uh, paper distributors. So quite often we get some really wonderful papers to work with and other studios don't. I just received um, 300 sheets of handmade paper this afternoon that are just amazing from a paper maker closed down. Does anybody make paper around here? I mean, there was a guy in um, uh, Vermont who sold his business, and I haven't talked to the guy who bought it, so in theory, that guy's still making paper. Now, Holyoke, and around here, there's still there's huge paper makers still around. They were. Are they closing, too? Pretty much all of them. All of them? Isn't there somebody in, like, South Hadley or something that's still going strong? Um, there's different people making specialty papers. Yeah. Nothing that we would ever use. Mm -hmm. like adhesive back papers, metallic papers. Um, there's still a lot of converters, people converting paper into envelopes. Um, but a lot of the big mills closed down. They were in Turner's Falls and Westfield and uh, Greenfield. And, uh, so it's not all artisan. There's all this loved artisan. Yeah, I mean, this, there were many big Strathmore mills around here that were producing. Um, you know, we get paper from France, from Holland, from Japan. Um, what is your go-to paper for? Uh, go-to paper is Crane. Crane. And they make, they uh, still make paper. They still don't make paper, but they don't make it in Dalton anymore. They make it in uh, Wisconsin. Wow. Didn't know that. Yeah. So yeah, they, they still make the money paper in Dalton, but they don't make the letter there. So I use that for probably 80% of the wedding invitations. Mm -hmm. I also use a lot from this company called French Paper, which still which actually uses water power to make the paper. There's a lot of companies that claim to be water or wind power, but they're actually just buying credits from the electric company to claim that, but these people actually have a waterfall and are running their factory. So really, what about Italy? Do you get any paper from Italy? Yep. They're kind of famous. Yep, I get from Fabriano. Um, one of the major mills there just closed, Magnani, uh, I think it is. Um, I get some papers from Spain. Um, Italian papers are kind of funny because they're very seasonal and batch oriented, the handmade papers, because they're the, the seasons are very either very dry or very wet. So in the spring, the papers we get have one color. In the fall, the papers have a little bit different color. Amazing. So if we're doing a project that really matters, we have to order all of our paper all at once um, so that it's the same color. One last question for you. Here we are in this beautiful old mill. We're talking about mills and mills closing and everything. What was this mill in this heyday? This building was um, a thread manufacturer when it started. Then at some point, they became an elastic thread Manufacturer. Right, that's what East Hampton was kind of famous for. Yeah. At one point, their, one of their big products was rubber bands. Mm -hmm. And then in the 70s, it just kind of phased yeah. out. And I pictured them making suspenders and girdles. Yeah, some corsets or something. Corsets, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when suspenders went out of style, the, the mills closed. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was all yeah. over. Yeah, I took a, a paper marbling class here from Faith Harrison um, probably 25 years ago. and. Just recently, I found my baby mar marbling supplies that I I got from her. We're going to be doing some paper marbling this week for a project. So that should be fun. Well, Bill, thanks so much for your time. I'm going to run around with my still yeah. camera and take some pictures and blend them in with all the things that we've been talking about. Yeah.